Well, thanks, thanks to you all for having me. Um, as I was telling Ferran, I feel a bit embarrassed to come and give a presentation again on election integrity uh, here at this university, as I've given some presentations before. Um, but let's hope I can get, tell you something new, and um, I'll probably go through the first part of the presentation a bit quickly so as to not bore you. And I hope that uh, I'll get from the audience whenever I'm telling you stuff that you already know. So this is a project that I'm doing together with Stefan Lindberg at the University of Gothenburg, uh, based on varieties of democracy data. It's a new data set that covers all the countries in the world from 1900 until 2012. They employed over 3,000 experts to code specific elements of democracy. Um, and based on that data, we also have more specific data on types of electoral uh, manipulation in different uh, countries. In this paper, we focus on Africa. It's now being published in Government and Opposition in a special issue on the future of democracy. Um, but I'm working on the analysis of a paper that looks at electoral manipulation globally to see if these patterns hold around the world. So your comments are anyway very, very useful, um, especially with regard to the theoretical framework, which needs further elaboration. So that's what I'll try to do in this presentation. Just quickly, why is this why is this interesting again? I mean, th that's good to, to remember every now and then. This is just a graph showing you the proportion of states holding national elections from 1900 until 2012. And as you can see, holding elections really has become the global norm. Almost 90% of nation states now hold elections. And what does that mean? That means that every self-respecting autocrat now holds elections as well. What does that mean? That it's become more interesting to look at the quality of elections. Um, because if you have this global spread of elections, we know there's way more autocracy than 10%. So that means that many of those elections will be rigged, and it's, it's worthwhile to have a look at how that works and how we can prevent that. And why is that worthwhile? Well, because people in these countries, citizens in new democracies around the world, care a lot about democracy. So even if we're disparaging about the quality of those elections, about these are the recent Nigerian elections, a lot of violence, a lot of allegation of vote rigging, uh, but people stand in line for hours to cast their votes. This is really a massive event for them, and they care about it. It's just a bit to illustrate how, how these elections work in, in developing country contexts. They make a lot of effort to make the ballot boxes transparent. Um, as you can see, the ballot papers are made for illiterate people, so you have only the pictures for the parties. Uh, where they can vote and just put their finger, they don't have to write their name. This is Sierra Leone, another example of people are willing to stand in the scorching sun for hours and hours because they find this so important, even if the election is rigged. And I found the same when I was in Congo. So yes, we have this global spread of elections, but the quality of elections is widely varying. On the question whether elections were free and fair, this is from the Rights of Democracy data, you can see the comparison between the world and Africa. Uh, experts were asked to code elections on five scores. So were they free and fair? No, not at all, not really. Ambiguous? Yes, somewhat, yes. Well, globally, the picture is not that bad, right? So we have about one third of elections that have problems, and the rest of them are coded as pretty much free and fair. So it seems like a good picture. And if we zoom in to certain continents, Africa, Asia, and former Soviet republics particularly, if we look at Africa, over half of elections have problems. Um, so it's a worthwhile topic to study. There's this gap between formal institutions and informal practice that generated the field of election integrity, so I'll skip over that. Just to mention that we all know it's a very difficult uh, concept to conceptualize, very difficult to measure as well. Um, Shameless Self-Promotion is an article where I try to bring all these measurements and concepts together and map them out um, in order to build, so that we can build on existing research. Um, I know you will know this, so just to, to go through because we use it in the, in the remainder of the paper. So the menu of manipulation is really vast from way before the elections until after the elections. And the electoral cycle demonstrates that quite neatly. You can manipulate the legal framework and the electoral management body. And if you do that well, you may not even need fraud in the later stages of the election. So we'll get to that um, in, the, in the paper, because we're going to look at the trade-offs between those different types of, of irregularity. Good, so what do we know? Sorry for this slide, let's skip over it. 
<laughs> I'll just summarize it for you. What we do know is what factors cause cross-national variation. And there really what we found so far uh, um, are the usual suspects. So poor countries, countries with large inequality, countries with a history of civil war, countries that are recent, have recently made the transition. All these kind of typical factors that we would expect uh, to cause problems for democratic governance, they cause problems for election integrity as well. Um, but what we don't know yet are two questions, and that is the role of time. We don't know how, within countries, elections improve or deteriorate. So what caused Venezuela to backslide? It started with the elections, but there's other institutions to study there as well. And what caused a country like El Salvador to slowly improve over time? If we know that, presumably, we know those factors that contribute to changes over time within countries, we'll get a better grasp at what really are the crucial causal factors that we need to, to tackle to strengthen election integrity. Okay, so that's the first, that first part. That's my background. So I hope some, maybe in two years' time, three years' time, I'll come back to you and, and give you a, a decent answer to that. <laughs> or maybe faster. <laughs> Let's see where we go. And the other question is causal mechanisms. Um, so it, I, I'm getting increasingly annoyed doing cross-national research and having a table with coefficients where you really wonder what's the connection between the variables and the outcomes. How does this work? What is the causal mechanism connecting the two? So it's wonderful that we know that poor countries have bad elections, but why? Um, and as long as we don't know the why, we also won't be able to, to find ways in which to strengthen election integrity. So that paper, this paper starts a little bit with that, what connects variables to outcomes? And there's four questions that are important there. To look really more at the ground level, what are actor strategies? So who engages in manipulation and who doesn't? What is the difference between incumbents and opposition? When does opposition choose to engage in manipulation? When do incumbents do so? What are the benefits? So how do you choose which different types of fraud? Which types of fraud pay off and which don't? And there may be massive differences within countries for different regions. For example, if the opposition is dispersed, you may want to rig the vote count because then you can't target them. If the opposition is geographically located, vote buying or intimidation may work much better. So do actors make these calculations and can we find evidence of those kind of cost-benefit calculation on the, at the local level? And what we look at in this paper is costs and trade-offs within that context. So which types of fraud are costly, which are not? Reasoning from an actor wanting to manipulate the, the elections, which types of manipulation are available to me, and then how do you make the choice between choosing one type of manipulation over the others, um, and how does the context uh, influence that, that choice set? So elections in Africa, we started in 1986 before, because before 1986 most regimes in Africa were either single party personalist dictatorships or socialist one party regimes. So very few elections were held uh, in the period between decolonization and, and 1986. And then slowly towards the end of the Cold War we start seeing more countries holding elections. And again in this continent this massive variation largely free and fair elections in Ghana to very, very flawed elections in Zimbabwe and, and, and Congo. So we have a lot of, of variation to, to study this question. This shows you the same graph I showed you for the world, but then for Africa, you see the in impact of the end of the Cold War on Africa, this massive jump to the number of countries that hold elections, and now almost all countries in Africa hold elections. But of course, they're very varied in their quality. So these are the data we have from the Varieties of Democracy uh, data set. A couple of types of manipulation, so we don't have the full cycle that I showed you before, but we have a couple of indicators, steps along the cycle that can be manipulated. And the light blue bar is where experts thought there were some problems, the proportion of elections which there were some problems, and the dark bar is the proportion of elections where experts thought there were serious problems. But as you can see, voter registry is not so problematic almost 30% of elections, but not very serious problems. Most are some problems. Election violence and government intimidation also doesn't seem to occur in so many elections, even though it gets a lot of attention in the media. Um, but it's not as common as these other two types of manipulation, where one is electoral management bodies. Capacity is a problem, but autonomy is an even bigger problem. And vote buying. Vote buying is seen to be the largest problem in Africa. So the question we look at in this paper is, 
how does that work? Are there trade-offs between these different irregularities? And to do that, we group strategies of manipulation in three strategies, so that um, it makes it easier to theorize about it. One strategy is to manipulate institutions. <coughs> the other, and that means rigging the electoral framework, getting a, an, an electoral management body that's under your control, so that's not independent, so that you can monitor the whole process and, and rig it from the start. The other is coercing voters and, and candidates, so basically sticks. And the other is co-opting voters and candidates, basically carrots, buying votes uh, and buying candidates to join you. So how, but imagine you're an actor and you want to rig the elections. How do you make a choice between those three types? We look at it from here from the cost perspective, right? So I want to rig the election. We make that assumption, and we make the assumption that all types of manipulation are equally effective, which is just so that we can look at the costs. What are the things you are likely to wonder about? Well, you're likely to ask yourself two questions. First, can I organize it? And can I organize it means, do I have the financial resources, but also do I have the organizational resources to get this going? So if you're an opposition actor and you want to engage in violence, you do need to have access to young people uh, who might have been involved in fighting before, who have weapons, uh, you need to organize them, you need to convince them that it's worthwhile to go and beat up voters or, or other candidates for you. Uh, vote buying, same way. It doesn't only need money, it needs local brokers that make sure that they get voters on board and monitor that they actually vote according to um, what they were paid for. So there's different kinds of organizational financial costs in organiza organizing different uh, forms of manipulation. And then the second question is, can I get away with it? And can I get away with it is based on three factors, or at least um, that's what we're thinking about now. First of all, visibility. Um, why is visibility important? Well, because if your manipulation is not visible, you avoid the formal and the informal sanctions that are involved with manipulation. So if you manage to get the electoral management body under your control and voters don't notice that, or if you manage to tweak the electoral framework, the legislative framework, to such an extent that you can exclude your opposition candidates People will generally not notice that happens a year before the elections, those kind of legislative changes. It's much more effective because you exclude uh, a large part of the opposition. Um, so non-visible forms of manipulation are likely to, uh, to be preferred. Again, why? Because it means you avoid the formal sanctions and you for avoid informal sanctions. What are formal sanctions? Well, formal sanctions are the judiciary or the electoral management body intervening um, and basically fining or sending people to jail for engaging in electoral manipulation. Informal sanctions are legitimacy costs, as they're referred to in the literature. So beating up voters is generally not appreciated by uh, the electorate, right? So the informal costs, the legitimacy costs of violence, you can only engage in so much violence before you get backlash, before you get a reaction from the population. So actors wanting to engage in, in, in manipulation are likely to weigh those three things. What are the informal sanctions? What are the formal sanctions? And is it visible, this type of manipulation? Now since sanctions only apply when fraud is visible, it follows that what is most important from these four elements defining the costs of manipulation is visibility and the direct costs. So cheaper and less visible manipulation strategies will be preferred, if possible. What are the cheapest strategies from the three we looked at? Well, the cheapest one is to manipulate the institutions. If you have access to manipulating institutions, that's the cheapest way to do it, because you generally don't have to pay for it. Your bureaucrats are working for you. Think of, uh, think of again, Putin. You're paying their salaries. So that's already part of the cost. Um, it's cheap to, to get that manipulation going. And it's <coughs> less visible. So the less visible is institutional manipulation followed by coercion and co-optation because both of these are rather visible. Intimidation of voters and, and vote buying. And the cheaper forms is institutional manipulation, then probably coercion, because especially in a, in a post-war context, weapons will be floating around um, and it's easier to organize groups to work to get in, engage into uh, intimidation. And co-optation in both cases 
cultivation is going to be the most expensive uh, form of manipulation because it requires massive financial resources and organizational resources, as we know from case studies on, on vote buying. What does that mean? Well, we can derive a sort of a general preference order. It means that actors, if they can, will first manipulate institutions. If that's no longer viable, they will shift to coercion. And if that's no longer viable, they will shift to cooptation. So we will find this, that's the preference order we expect to find. First institutional manipulation, then coercion, and then cooptation. Yet, there are differences in the context. Because democratization, and that's why we formalize it like this, because then you can show how democratization changes the potential costs. Why? Well, it changes the visibility. Increasingly, independent media will make sure that electoral manipulation is noted. Formal sanctions are increased because both the electoral management bodies and the judiciary become more independent. Informal sanctions are also likely to change because norms about what is acceptable behavior are also likely to change as democratization progresses. So what does that mean? If we combine these two things, we'd expect that as democratization occurs, institutional manipulation is less viable. Now, that's not very surprising because that's the essence of democratization, right? Yet, what happens if this occurs, if institutional manipulation is less viable, coercion and cooptation become more attractive. So then what happens is that we find something that has been found in the literature on violent elections, that initial increases in democratization, initial shifts um, in a country's regime level, uh, level of democracy, will lead to an increase in violence. And that's what people like Jeff Snyder are, are all on about. We shouldn't organize elections too quickly after a transition because we'll have violence. Well, what we show here is that that's a logical consequence of democratization. You'll have an increase in the first stages of democratization. And you'll have an increase in vote buying. Mm. So what does that mean? It means that if a country democratizes, we don't necessarily expect electoral manipulation to decline. We just expect it to shift to other types of manipulation. OK, so here are the hypotheses formalized. Um, I have the table in the paper where you can find the result, but just shortly to summarize, we do find indeed this trade-off between vote buying and institutional manipulation. So we measure cooptation by vote buying, and so we find that if the institutions cannot be manipulated, you will find higher vote buying. That's a confirmation of this general preference order. We don't find this effect for coercion. So Government intimidation and opposition violence tend to go together with the manipulation of the institution. So there, something doesn't work in our, in our argument about uh, costs. But we do definitely find this trade-off between vote buying and, and institutional manipulation. And then looking at the effect of the context, um, you can see it again in the tables, but I visualized it. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you about the data. Anyway, should I tell you about the data? <laughs> Very quickly, this is data set. Sorry, guys. Um, basically, I told you about the data set already, but this is good to know. We measured the institutional manipulation by combining manipulation of the voter registry, the EMB capacity, and the EMB autonomy in one variable. We measure coercion by government intimidation and election violence, and this is a measure of opposition violence. So we have the opposition side and the government side and we measure cooptation by vote buying, uh, basically the bar chart I showed you before. And so we do find this trade-off between institutional manipulation and vote buying, and then if we look at changes as countries democratize, we find this. Um, so what does this show you? This shows you the level of democracy with elections taking out, so civil liberties. This is not a measure that includes elections. These are full autocracies, these are full democracies. And as you can see from the data, the dotted line, this is government intimidation. No, this is election administration manipulation. It goes down quite straight. So as countries democratize, increasingly less institutions will be manipulated, which is what we would expect, and it's a good thing. Also, government intimidation declines. So coercion also declines as countries democratize. Yet, vote buying goes up and it doesn't seem to be time. 
So that means that it's really wonderful when countries democratize because institutional manipulation declines, intimidation declines, so elections generally do get cleaner, but they don't get entirely clean, and money politics is still a massive problem in Africa, even at democracies that we consider liberal democracies. So what I did now is I'm trying to do these analysis on a global sample, and it's really interesting because if we look at worldwide elections, we also don't find a decline. So vote buying just goes up with democratization and it stays at a stable level. Um, so that's a question if we'll ever get clean elections, even in the best democracies. Well, that's it, I think. I already gave you the conclusions. Mm -hmm. They go together, institutional manipulation and government intimidation. So apparently that is a, that's a good mix of, uh, of strategies for incumbents to stay in power in democracies. We find this trade-off. If you can't manipulate the institutions, you'll turn to vote buying. And democratization is associated with an increase in vote buying. That's it, I think. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carolyn.